Yeah, we are ready now. We are ready, sir. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the last edition of the lecture series "Fresh Out of the Oven." Uh, my name is Pratyush Shankar, and I work at SEDA uh, at Navrachna University in Baroda. Uh, if you have been following this series, that uh, we have invited uh, graduates of architecture and design uh, in different cities in India, doing different things. We are calling this series "Fresh Out of the Oven," and uh, this series is essentially trying to bring together people. who after their graduation or after their studies or academics took very divergent paths uh, what we are trying to say here and this is more keeping in mind the student community of our college and in fact student community everywhere that there are many routes that one can take after one graduates uh, the notion that architects and design designers should be and would be doing only a few things is something that we are questioning and a lot of these uh, architects that we had in the series uh, have demonstrated to us the possibilities of the profession or how it is possible to pursue one's own interest uh, make a career out of it but more importantly ask many relevant question today we have uh, sonal mithal with us she is actually professor dr sonal mithal Uh, also a dear friend and uh, she is going to be presenting her work uh, and before i introduce uh, sonal in a more formal fashion uh, i have had the good opportunities to interact with her as a colleague at sept university where i was teaching earlier and uh, it was wonderful actually knowing her as a person a very calm person uh, a very very balanced person it was wonderful to see her discussing um uh, architecture uh, it, it was nice to have somebody who transcended the world of theory and practice in a very interesting fashion sonal even though is not as much fresh out of the oven as many others but i still wanted to put her in that category uh, not to please you sonal but uh, <laughs> for the fact that you represent uh, a kind of a very disciplinary diverse range she calls herself an architect artist but she straddles the world of theory practice and also conservation in terms of domain and landscape you know so it's a very interesting mix and uh, she's also an artist uh, you know so i was pretty fascinated by that background so welcome sonal for this uh, for this edition thanks for agreeing to be with us and i will just read out a little uh, formal introduction of yours for everyone here and then uh, the stage is all yours so sonal is a conservation architect artist she holds a doctoral degree in landscape architecture from university of illinois a masters degree in architectural conservation from school of planning and architecture in delhi and bachelor's degree in degree in architecture from lucknow university at her conservation firm people for heritage concern her work prioritizes archival and material research based architectural conservation and artistic practice so this is a very very uh, kind of a unique profile that she has her work has been kind of exhibited all across the world in venice biennale and she as as you know has been teaching at many places and more importantly she has been teaching at the post graduate program of history theory and criticism at sept university so welcome sonal thanks for thanks for agreeing to come here well uh, virtually if not physically <laughs> Uh, Sonal is also teaching a wonderful course on history in Navrachna right now, and I'm very excited to have you. And the stage is all yours, Sonal. All right. Thank you, Pratyush, and uh, it's an honor to be here. And, uh, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my work and speak about it, and in the process also ideate about it. So, without further uh, delay let me just share my screen and then we can get started all right is my screen visible yes it is sonal all right okay so let's begin um so 
Uh, let me give you a first uh, little bit of a brief uh, idea about how what I'm doing in this talk. So just as a disclaimer, it's not like I'm not going to walk you through any one project or like, you know, show you about the details of a project. But uh, I'm using one project that I've been working on. It's an ongoing project, which is the conservation of the Surya Castle. Um, and using that as a, a springing board to contest a lot of things that we end up doing in practice, and then how those contestations become part of, you know, some other inquiry, which takes the form of maybe an artistic expression or not just an expression, but an artistic inquiry, which also translates into classrooms and, you know, paper writing and all of those things. Uh, so here in this presentation, I'm not going to give you a whole, you know, now this thing, a spectrum of, you know, what are the various ways in which the inquiry emerges, but I will use Surat Castle project as a springing board to then, um, to then, you know, share with you some of the work that emerges in the form of artistic practice. So just the two that I am bringing together. And uh, um, yeah, so, that, so there is like, there also another disclaimer, there is no chronological sequence to it. The only sequence that might be uh, available to you as an audience might be the questions that tie each other. So it might be navigating from this project to that project and so on and so forth, not even chronologically. But what I'm offering to you or sharing with you is how I am linking them together. What is the relationship between them? And uh, so, yeah, uh, also fresh off the oven. It's like, again, yeah, I'm not so fresh, but again, uh, I, it, it is always good to be fresh. Now, this image that we have here on the right hand side is the image from uh, the Surat Castle itself. And we had uh, customized bricks made for one of the sections of the castle, which is like 17 inch by 17 inch by two inches thick. So I thought it was like really fresh out of the oven. And I thought like, let me just put it there. Um, but it has got nothing to do with the dog. I'll say except for the title. Anyway, so um, the castle, uh, this is a layout of the castle um, and it is, um, it's, we don't need to understand the footprint of it, but what is relevant is that this castle has been built um, through several centuries and each of the construction layer in, the, in this castle is evident and also very important. And one of the basic questions that we ask in conservation is like, which is that particular moment in history that you would like to preserve or where would you like to go back into time or which you want to highlight? Now, given this kind of a place where all construction layers are so important, it becomes very difficult to answer that question, but also at the same time, it can be that which makes the project very unique. So this is like the basic um, uh, background that this castle is extremely layered. Um, and the layering that you can see is like, this is developed from several um, historical maps that were present in the archives starting from 1700 to 2013. 2013, sorry, 15 is the one which is like devised by our office based on what we found on the site. I'm again, not going into the details of this thing, but to bring to you the discipline that comes by looking at historical information and making it your own. So here you do not see the historical imagery. You see something that has been adapted. But you can see how the castle kind of, you know, some of the layers were erased and then they came back. Uh, like say, for example, the first one, you can see that some of the buildings get vanish and then they re-emerge. Also the moat vanishes, but it re-emerges in our project. So again, that is not the point. Um, then, you know, one way of doing that, one way of addressing those layers would be that we show them um, show them as layers, as separate entities. And this slide here is just a very brief overview of like uh, 
I don't like to call them this way, that like it's British construction or Tugla construction or Southnet construction, but for lack of a better vocabulary, let's keep it that way. Um, which has to say with the thing that it is the type of construction and not to do with the identity. So we are here looking at the technological logic. So you can see in say, for example, the ground floor, we have the same building, which was the earlier thing, uh, which was the Tuglag, and then it becomes something else. And later on, it has, it starts to acquire post-independence and a sultanate logic and so on. So the same room tends to have too many layers. And so what do you do with this thing? What do, how do you even deal with that? So one way of doing that would be you put things on a timeline, you de-layer everything and you put all the evidence, identify, all right, everything is separated at, as layers. And that is something, see on the right hand side, on the lower right, you can see that this is, this kind of a visualization is then commissioned by the, by the client. It's like, all right, you bring everything that you found, put it on a layer and show it to us and it's more informative, which is fine. But another way of doing that would be to put all these things as if they are contesting each other and those kind of, that is where um, <clears throat> you start to identify the relationships of what you read in your history books, what you hear by way of, you know, stories or legends or, you know, your grandmother sitting and telling you about what happened, um, so on and so forth. So how do you bring all these things together? And one of the earliest experiments that I started doing, which is, of course, uncommissioned work, is nobody's interested in like, you know, giving money for these kind of projects, but these kind of inquiries I started doing on my own that, all right, I want to bring all these things together and see how they uh, combine. <clears throat> this, is a <clears throat> this is a project uh, where I was looking at the history of Lucknow for a particular purpose. So some of the buildings that got demolished, why they got demolished, the story that about the demolition or how it was used is also put on the canvas. <clears throat> other like you know other stories about how the mutiny or the uprising happened and the blood that uh, this street along which there was a lot of bloodshed and all those things so there is an abstraction that starts to emerge in the highlighting or a, you know and uh, highlighting or exaggeration of what you see in the historical text so this kind of an illustration or a representation allows you for that exaggeration, which probably in a layered timeline logic kind of, you know, settles and becomes evened out. So again, like, you know, looking at not just the building itself, but what else was going on, what were the kind of cars that, were, what are the kinds of advertisements that are coming up, what is the language like, and so on and so forth. So everything that combines to a particular inquiry is like just thrown onto the canvas and juxtaposed with each other. So this is one of the very crude earlier invest inquiries that I started doing. Um, and what I'm doing is like, this is, this, is, this is like the raw material where, you know, uh, several evidences from the archives are put together in a meaningful fashion. And then, you know, by way of working colors and all that, um, the exaggeration of the argument emerges. So that is another way of doing it. Like, you know, in, um, what if the castle has layers of history? What do you do? So coming back to the castle again, the castle does not necessarily just have the layers and spaces, but you can see, look at this image itself. This image has, um, can you see my mouse? This, um, the brick itself in the same wall is changing. Now, and somewhere it's corroded, somewhere, you know, the mortar is thicker than the brick itself. Somewhere you can see a different kind of jointing. And all of this is evidence that we found on the site itself. When you have this kind of a complexity, when you have this kind of a complexity where, you know, uh, um, even on the wall itself, like maybe, um, yeah, this is a better example that this is the brick wall and then you have a bamboo and a mud wall and then you have a truss going on. So it is like a very complex, just in one space, maybe the walls do not belong to the, to the construction technology of the roof. Like I mean to say it might be Dutch, say for example, and this bamboo may not belong to, the, to that style. So 
But all of these are evidences that you find on the site and they are all important. So how do you respond to that? Another example of, you know, what you find on the site. Uh, you can see like, you know, just the wall behind is made in a very extremely sophisticated arched manner. And this is like the crude mud wall that is there. Um, and similarly, another this thing where you have this kind of a construction, this wall comes up later at time to buttress the two falling um, bastions. So this is the complexity. Now, one way of addressing that would be, which is commissioned, is, you know, for example, the section, if you see, the section, this room is here. This is the room. Now, the lower half, the lower half is a style, let's call it the Tughlaq style, which has like white bricks and as thick a mortar. And on top of that is the British construction, which is like, you know, your usual stuff that we are all familiar with. So now what do we do? What we have done is maybe we've kept, everything is plastered for whatever, just this much part is left open for people to see and the construction technology is very evident. And then once you see that line, this line is here, you start to see that this construction aligns with that, the lower construction aligns with that. So you yourself start to see that this all is Tughlaq, this all is British and so on and so forth. So, you know, keeping the thing available for people to view makes it, uh, makes the building itself readable and knowledge generation. So we don't have to, you know, rely too much on architectural history books, the building itself becomes its own archive in that sense. So this is one way of doing it. But the other way, which is the uncommissioned work is, and maybe this preceded this decision. So one way is to actually just, you know, trace out and which is like a painting, but trace out the various evidences of what is that which is distinct or, uh, and animally in the whole construction logic. So if you have an arch, which is a certain kind of a brick, and then you have another kind of construction going on. So this is like just an exercise in able to identify what are the things that are actually um, comp composing this wall and base, and just to internalize, this is an exercise in internalizing, you internalize this, and then you come to this decision that, all right, let's do this very in a very clean manner. So similarly, this, these are again, another iteration of how just the wall itself has different kinds of, uh, you know, components that uh, contribute to the, to the wall. It's like, you know, tracing is an exercise in appreciation or acknowledgement. So to answer that question, if you had something which is so layered and so historically rich archive wise, one of the things that you could do, which was also commissioned by the Soviet Municipal Corporation is make it a timeline and you identify all right. So that was like a very rich, this thing, history of ships coming in, going out and you know, which ship went where, who did it belong to so on and so forth. So we do this kind of an exercise it becomes part of an expert and so on and so forth. Uh, you also identify where all the Surat has been in its, uh, you know, in uh, uh, the cosmopolitan logic of the historical world that starting 1500s, it was very much like cosmopolitan. It, it was present in the cosmopolitan uh, imagination and, you know, knowledge of the world. So this is one way of doing it, where you put all this archive, you can also make these kind of panels, which are also very, you know, linear. You, what you find in the archives, you bring here, you tell what you have to highlight, what are they saying about. So one way is like you bring the archive to the exhibit itself and let the people, you know, read what they have to read and how they interpret. Your job is just to highlight, hey, read this thing. And, you know, so by this way, there is like this other thing that you problematize the archive by highlighting some of the very um, um, condescending stuff that a lot of British writers have written about Indians. And so some of the panels that I did for this was actually just highlighting those parts. It got, um, funnily, it got approved because nobody cared to read what I have highlighted. Uh, otherwise, if they actually read it, it would not have, uh, 
fast the you know this thing anyway so this is a very linear way of doing it the other way of it is to actually look at some of the drawings that you found in the archives and obscure them because they have now been obscured some of them are not visible so this is one kind of a representation where it actually starts to not just say what it was but the obscurity or the erasure is something that you can bring to the canvas and make a case that hey history is also a lot about erasures and who is writing about those things so this is where what you have internalized starts to emerge similarly like you know other maps and this is a, 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 a derived from a map which was uh, well it's uh, it says uh, from the route from surat to mazuli patnam via rangabad and golconda and this map marks all those places where mangoes were the, the person who was traveling found mangoes now it's a linear map because you know surat and mazuli patnam they are like from west to east but what i've done here is like i've broken it and merged it together and you know what not and so on and so forth but just to highlight the relationships and also the fact that you know this map by itself may not mean anything but you know to be to bring it out of the archive and make it visible that hey there was a relationship between surat and mazuli patnam and you know so that happens also like you know some kind of um, the the challenge of the challenge that you give yourself or the rule that you give yourself that my my canvas is going to be a square canvas and so on and so forth so that also makes a lot of um decisions and then you know now this is again also another uh, inquiry of the historical archives where uh where i found a pilot's mini diary which mentioned the depth of uh the sea i don't know the units uh, it was a nautical depth i don't know what it means but uh, at various places along the coast of the surat uh the thing on the arabian sea telling how where they could moor the ships or not and so i thought let me just give it a visualization uh logic but now this is something uh which doesn't necessarily relate directly to the castle but it has an indirect relationship so this kind of an inquiry doesn't find its way into the exhibit so it remains at your own you know level of investigation and so on and so forth now what develops from that is that all right you did these kind of inquiries which didn't lead anywhere but then finally there was this one project that happened which was about hey let's look at the surat uh, ka industrial area which is hazira which is also very posh but is also very polluted um because you have all the iron foundries you have coal that comes from china to hazira and all of these things are happening so that place is very polluted but they wanted a representation and they wanted a representation in hotel fair feet marriott we want the industrial landscape of surat to come up and it's it's and the mandate was that you ha it has to be good looking and happy but we are we are looking at something which is polluting so how do you do that i will not talk too much here but these are some representations which are actually about the materiality like an iron foundry and how the iron smells so what is actually happening on the site and you kind of device turn it into a material logic so the materials that have gone into the creation of this illustration are actually industrial materials and so allowing the material to take its own course and shape is how these illustrations have developed so you can see like you know it's all black small this is all these are all trucks that are lying next to it carrying goods and a lot of smoke and a lot of darkness and it's this is how it is um this is again like you know what hazira is like black oil and uh, polluting and this is made with iron actually iron and epoxy iron filings and epoxy and black pigment this is again another visualization of the same logic uh but also like you know 
thing is coming away and so it is breaking and you know um, so all of those the breaking and all of those things are all feeding into the collapse of the landscape but to to the fair field they like it because it's you know it's black black against red and yellow and so on so it works for them these are other examples which are like kind of more abstract versions of you know the industrial nature of the buildings on the site and again similar like you have the coal mounds and you know these wild flowers that grow in in that coal land coal laden landscape these are all done in cement again industrial material this is also all these are done in both these pieces are done in cement and they're quite tall i think they're six feet tall so um like now, what is the thread that joins that and this this project? This is uh, this is a project that was done. Uh, the, what ties them together is the industrial nature, the industry, and what impact they have on the you know on the environment and both social environment and you know the physical environment. So if this was about the physical environment, this is about the social environment. And this was a project that was for the Havra Jute industry. It was to represent the Havra Jute industry and basically the labor, uh, the, the obscuring of the labor in Havra. Um, and uh, so I again used images. So you can see, I, I think it's, it's weird that I, I will, I'm pointing out, but you can see the obscurity of a human element with a cycle and a bag carrying a tiffin. And that against, you know, the heavy machinery of the jute and using the jute itself to, to bring out the tension and the resistance that is prevalent in the underbelly of the jute industry. So, yeah, these are some, again, some images from that. Using the various uh, um, um, Jute in the process of being manufactured has very different qualities. So various uh, pieces of jute from various stages have been used in this thing to in, in these paintings to uh, to represent that. And jute is used to spread the uh, the color uh, or you know to highlight. So as much amount of jute is able to absorb or allows it to spread is what gets highlighted. And that is what uh, is done here. So a lot of the representation is carried forward by the material itself. Again, this is using jute and epoxy. So, uh, yeah. Okay, now coming back to Surat again, uh, the castle again. So what you see here is, uh, is again, the layering. And so one of the ways to deal with this layering would be to actually, you know, uh, open it out, clean it, remove all the, uh, you know, all the dead material or remove all that is um, dilapidated or dead or rotting and, you know, the weak, this thing, and you put them reconstructed together using <clears throat> you know, the most relevant technology, <clears throat> you construct it as much flows as you can be to retain the concert nature of the construction. Now, Surat is a very interesting castle because it is not, it was not a residential place at all. It was always an administrative unit. Um, so you can see that the construction is very crude and weird because you have stone. Most of the castle is made in brick but you have enough stone to strengthen it. But it's not like a unified stone thing and stone is not us usually available in Surat. So they had to import it from, you know, Porbandar. So they were, you know, making it brick with a little bit of stone here and there. And so this kind of a strategy is again, you know, carried forward. So you get this kind of, you see, you know, in some parts you keep the, old in some parts you have new ones and so on and so forth which is fine just one day but then i want to come back to this thing this if this is the character in which you find the castle this is how we found it and you 
see this so often that uh, what you are seeing here is you know the the tree, the vegetation which is taking its roots in the in the structure it's everywhere it's ubiquitous it's almost like as if it's a canopy um and you know if you remove this thing the castle will also fall you know look at this thing this is how it was you can see it's going all the way up it's everywhere look at this thing so um now one way of doing that would be to do this which we did for the uh, castle which is like you inject it with poison and remove it and you clean it up and make it accessible now this is a very human centric and which is like more accepted norm of doing things uh, but what it also made me think is that this is happening and so let's maybe use this as a line of inquiry to see if we can use this as a strategy for conservation in our forthcoming projects if not immediately and maybe in like the long term can this be your strategy to can the tree itself become that which strengthens the structure so uh, so we started some naive inquiries about you know how are the various ways in which trees are coming and hugging the building which are kind of ruined so this is a study which was in pickers mill in amdabad um this is see the whole building is kind of falling it's it's in tatters but what is being held is by these roots of these of this tree so this is evidence that maybe yes you can maybe i don't have an answer right now but it is a line of inquiry and a question uh that i like to take in my studios i'm not going to talk about that but can this become some kind of a way forward of thinking building um so you know some kind of investigation started and it's again a very very crude investigation at the moment mostly visual in nature um of various ways in which the root is going and fixing its the tree is going and fixing itself in the buildings wherever it is taking the shape and then the building itself also uh aligning itself breaking its component parts and aligning itself with with the live part which is the vegetation so this is becoming a hybrid and in that sense the building is also alive that it becomes very much part of the of the tree see the, the, the it's the tr the tree is taking its form but also the building is allowing it to go inside it so you know it becomes that hybrid and in that sense it becomes the two of them coexist so what can we do and again similarly that same example that you had uh, the same image you had seen so then uh, i started doing some investigations using some basalt and concrete and uh, imagining can we like create some kind of a structure which is able to stand like a small thing uh using a little bit of metal and can can that stand so you know the imagery is coming from those images but the idea was to create something which can stand by itself so this was one thing that i did it was like a massive failure it started to bulge and you know all of those things and then was like all right let let's just look at concrete and just let's look at the basalt itself and use as thin sections as possible to make a hybrid thing where basalt was a derivative of something which is organic and cement is by default you know uh, the inorganic so these are some hybrid sculptures that emerged uh, which actually went to this nature it's called the art science pavilion and they were inviting entries for uh quite uh, for artwork which was like kind of uh representing the some questions related to climate change or you know um adaptation and so on and so forth so in the adaptation logic can these can the building can we think adapt adaptive buildings or buildings that are able to you know change if there is some kind of a common component like a plant component and i don't have an answer to that it might sound very silly at the moment but this is what was the representation about 
So taking the root itself of the banyan tree uh, and uh, creating sculptures which are able to stand themselves in combination with basalt and cement. Um, <clears throat> similarly, again, like basalt was used in various ways, again, basalt and cement. I think and that is about it. Yeah, this one, like, which is again, basalt and cement, and it's like, just take, this was about, like, one thread of basalt is going to hold the weight. So, I think that is about it. Yeah, so, and I have also stuck to the time. Yes. Thank so, you, Sonal. Yes. Uh, can you stop sharing the screen? Yes. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for this uh, very wonderful uh, and a very different presentation. And I think I've, I've not come across uh, many conservation architects who can talk about layers of history and in some sense then correlate with their own art projects. And I guess there are a couple of questions that, and I'm very, very, very you know, curious to hear what you have to say because I think when you are creating artworks uh, which are provoked by your own practice, right? Uh, in some sense, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, you're not saying it very forthright, forthrightly, but there's a lot of statements that you're already making. Uh, especially, I was fascinated by two or three things that you said when you spoke about the archival, uh, highlighting the archival. Uh, and leaving it there or moving away from a linear narrative of a map and uh, breaking it apart or taking it apart and putting it together to form possible other narratives that people can, people have the choice to form. Uh, I'm also, I would like to, you know, we'll open the session for more questions, but I have a few questions. I would like to know more about uh, about that part of how do you look at uh, history? Because that's the question that you're actually raising. Uh, what you are hinting at, and perhaps what you're saying it in a very clear fashion sometimes is that uh, you're uncomfortable with this kind of a meta narrative, a single truth, a linear narrative of history. And as a conservation architect, you would like to allow for other ways to look at the past. Would you like to elaborate on this? This is a very large question, I know, uh, but you know, somehow your work, uh, especially the work on maps and uh, you know, some of those work really provoke that kind of a response. Yeah, so I think, you know, um, it has a lot to do with our training and uh, the way I've been trained is that, all right, to accomplish any conservation work, it is highly research oriented. Yeah. And when the training is in research, then you have a certain set of archives you look into. And we're also trained into looking into the maps and it comes by default. Um, so reading maps, that is all right. But now what happens, and this is where the problem starts to appear that we, conservation as a field has always, al always kind of prioritized wanting to go back to an original moment Right. and separate the layers right. <clears throat> and going back to that moment is always uh, you know pushed by a political agenda right so one of the things that somehow during my career or you know even my training or whatnot or you know having been part of so many disciplines allowed me to distance from that and question that thing and you know question we all question that but how what is the answer to that and how then do we say that, all right, we can have, we say that history is palimpsestic, but can we conserve in a palimpsestic manner? Right. And th if that is the challenge that we give to us, then we will have those kind of walls where, you know, uh, uh, we have like the Tuglak scene and you have like a small, you know, a soft original stone, which is already tearing apart, seen like clustered within the rest of the mm. things which has been cleaned up, you want, so on and so forth. Right. So when you start looking at, if you train yourself into just looking at everything as a palimpsest, then maybe, you know, 
more answers emerge. So that is what uh, we are like trying to train ourselves to do is like consider history as a palimpsest, Correct. essentially, and not a linear thing. No, and not I, even like a cyclical thing, but it's more yeah. like palimpsestic. Where, yeah, you know, I think something that's, that's flawed. yeah, thanks for this, because I think it, it's really helpful to students who are watching this. And I'm, I'm trying to kind of, you know, position your work uh, from the perspective of your ideology of history. And I think you, as a professor, we all have our take on history or rather, well, on the world at large, it's not just a take on history. So I think uh, thanks for that uh, kind of a clarification because it really helps young mind to understand it. Now, before I, I have one more question, but before that, I would just send out a message to my students and also my staff, my colleagues here, that if you have a question, People who are in the Zoom room, if they have a question, they can type it into the chat. Students who are watching uh, it on YouTube, you can type in the question to either Shalini, Amin, or Pragya, and they will forward it to me and I will read out the question. Uh, so now the second question I have, and uh, that is related to the word that you use, hybrid. Mm. And I think just today with one of the students, I was discussing this whole question of uh, hybrid and how hybrid as a term as an idea is very different from the term fusion where things are fused together and become something else where, where in a hybrid condition each entity retains its character to a certain extent and yet it is together and uh, I was pretty fascinated by how you are looking at the problem as part of the solution right and uh, you know when you talk about those roots being used as as a as a way to uh, well keep the building together but i think i don't think you are only seeing it from a technical perspective of keeping the building together as a tech, as a construction challenge but i think you are in my mind making a larger statement about how we how we look at history how we look at ruins and the fact that trees have grown over it uh, is a reality or there is dust over history over past is a reality that needs to be acknowledged and accepted and perhaps celebrated uh, or I don't know whether you're referring more to the question of nature and culture here but there is something more that I would love to hear about your uh, your ideological take on this question of hybrid. I would not uh, let you go away uh, with that. Yeah, I think yeah. it's a fantastic question. And I actually thank you because uh, this gives me an opportunity to also think, uh, say what I think. Um, I, I see this as, you know, like w the point that I want to make and, you know, uh, by highlighting that the the tree is taking over in the absence of human agency is taking over the building or the environment and the building itself is adapting what i want to highlight is the absence of the human agency and despite the absence of the human agency things survive and the ruination of a building itself is a form of survival you know anything that stands which has adapted to the to the roots is surviving everything else which has not adapted falls away in so the ruin itself has a life of its own it has its own agency the material has its own agency and the human uh, is uh, so what i want to bring to the core is like a little bit of a post-humanist thinking that the human doesn't have to come from the top from the outside in the workings like even as an architect or a conservation architect can we like also become that one of the you know hybrid entities in this in this you know building uh, tree human logic where it is maybe we are able to just create conditions for the thing to adapt to develop on its own and not imagine it like how it will be or give a like you know um a very deterministic proposal or, you know, a solution to a problem, but just letting things be a little bit here and there, so on and so forth. So uh, I don't know if I made that clear, but, you know, the point is like at some point, looking at it at some point, 
how much do we intervene and how much do we step back to be able to determine that is probably what i want to highlight using that um, this thing um Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I'm very glad I asked that question because I think that uh, and I think you really clarified it. But it's a it's a it's a quite an interesting premise that you have uh, of uh, you know the idea of a nation or the post-human, where human is seen as rather something that is not there but enters the space. But also, I, I guess what it is doing is raising extremely provocative question of how to look at. Mm-hmm. conservation itself mm-hmm. and i think the value of uh, your artwork or even your explorations or experiments you uh, even if they not realized uh, has the potential to raise questions about how we look at things right and i think that's the that's that's what i find as extremely extremely useful in your work and uh, which connects me to my light last question is uh, how do you transcend uh this harsh world of profession where you have to speak to a mayor or speak to the you know the lobby manager or the hotel uh, you know in charge at that hotel where you put all those paintings on hazira and the critical skeptical side of you who is also critiquing this industrialization or this world or the horrors of whatever you know what we have seen you have done uh you really don't find people wearing both the coats quite often you have this uh, practitioners who are practicing and they they really do not have the bandwidth to detach themselves from from practice and ask very fundamental question about how do they look at their profession or for for in your case what is conservation and what is history and then you have these artists who have an ability because of their detached nature from the you know the nitty gritty realities or the gritty realities of the profession they have the ability to critique and i'm just wondering you're doing both right now or it is trying to do both how do you navigate that to have you dedicated yeah. a few days for this and few days for that or no it's uh, actually see a lot of this work which uh, emerged from uh, which saw the light of the day in terms of you know the decision making and all that <clears throat> it's not easy and i also have the privilege of not having to do the talking um so that is like at least that way i see it as a privilege um but uh, what happens is that the client or say for example surat municipal corporation they want a very they they said when we gave the project to you we just wanted a little bit of decoration and cleaning and white washing and all that we never thought that this project is going to become like this so there was a lot of resistance that came but because um and here this is where i would kind of you know give a lot of uh credit to our training like my partner sumeshus and my training that we have been trained so strictly into research that we would not do anything like it would just not occur to us how do we approach this project without research and when so a lot of research happened on our own expense uh and even today like you know just going to the to england and finding the you know data like it was all you know the whole expenditure is on us all the panels that you saw the, all the research was like expenses and everything was on our the thing let let's do it because we have to reach a decision of what has to be done on the site and when uh, we could convince them that hey look at this plan and see there was a moat here and we have to remove these offices and i'm not even going into the details of the project so then they were like convinced all right and we i, I mean not me so may i have to talk to them in this manner are you willing to be in the court of law and taking the responsibility that we actually are you know hiding the moat underneath it if i prove it in the court so you know a lot of dhamkis also have to happen and so on and so forth from at least i'm safe safeguarded from that but that's not the point the point is like a lot of these researchers sometimes are you know we have to do it on our own sake because and that way we have to normalize this practice so what happened is that after you know the first year 
when they realize that all the work is dependent on research, now it's become a normalized thing. So now they are all right. You do research and then, so that has become part of the tender. You know, so uh, the, my appeal to the, you know, to the practitioners is that, that we, we are the ones who have to fight for the relevance of research. We cannot become vehicles of, you know, hum practice mein ye karenge and we research mein ye karenge. So, and it's not always an easy job. Even today, like when, um, they said, all right, we have to do the exhibition and all that. And uh, I was like, we, uh, we have these paintings and they're like, no, we don't want to have these things. We want something like more flashy and all that. So there are like, you know, things that they don't pick. And one last thing, a lot of times, like even for Zira project and uh, for this exhibition, um, because I don't like confrontation, I go into guerrilla mode. So like, you know, it's, uh, I was, very sure they are not going to see what is in the panels. They are just going to approve it simply based on the, on the logic. So the content nobody cares about. So a lot of these things, see Hazira maybe they, what I pitched to them is the material and the colors. I didn't pitch that it's looking like, you know, oil and all. So it is like the guerrilla tactic which sometimes, I don't know, that is a good thing to do, but I just do it that way. And some, it works most of the times. At least in the exhibition, it worked fantastically. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks for that, uh, <laughs> that advice on the Kerala tactic. But I, I, I mean, it's pretty fascinating how much invested you are um, in, in kind of uh, asking the right question. Uh, and I quite like your analogy or rather your comment about uh, how practice can also support research. And also, and then I think also more so in our country where the general research funding environment is pretty dismal. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we need to create our own opportunities mm -hmm. uh, to do research. And that's what we also try to do in our own practice on uh, city level research. But that's something uh, I think very encouraging for, for, and also I think a lot of young people who are watching, uh, they keep asking that uh, we are interested in research. How do you suggest we go about it? And I think in your case, it's a very good example of how one can try uh, to bring the question of research uh, when there is no research funding. You're actually creating your own funding and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So uh, thanks for that, uh, Sonal. I think uh, it was uh, really wonderful to have you. Thanks for agreeing to come uh, join uh, the YouTube session. And it's really a revelation. Uh, I've been interacting with you more in terms of what we teach and how we teach. But I, I see it as an opportunity for a wonderful conversation. And I think uh, what I've also realized is to get the best out of you, to, you is to ask questions. Yes. And uh, I think uh, maybe we should plan a nice uh, panel discussion where we can get more people. And, uh, you know, I think then the flow and the mood can, uh, can be interesting. But thanks, Sonal, for coming. Absolutely. Uh, wonderful to listen to you. Wonderful to know more about your work and how you're approaching it. And I'm sure it's going to uh, be a source of uh, inspiration for a lot of young people who are watching this. Thanks for that. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Uh, really so, uh, so thank you everyone for watching this. With this, uh, we come to the end of uh, the lecture series, uh, fresh out of the oven. Uh, we have had some uh, wonderful uh, lectures in this. We have seen a whole range of practices that have come about and also some wonderful conversations we have had with our speakers. Uh, we are ending this lecture series, but we are soon starting a new lecture series. I think that is called as a Seda Navrachna lecture series. Uh, it should start in two weeks time with a lecture by Julia Hegewald, who has written the book, Water Structures of India. She's a professor in the University of Bonn in Germany. But before that, next week, uh, I am giving a talk, Sonal, I think you would also love to join on 3rd of September, that is a Thursday at 5 p.m. And I'm, I'm sharing uh, the whole cross-section of my journey as an architect. Uh, it's known as an architect's journey. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a talk where I'll be showing uh, my major projects of the last 20 years or so, apart from some research projects. So hope to see you all uh, in that particular talk and subsequently in the SEDA lecture series. And thanks everyone for watching this. Have a very good night. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thank Sonal.